Okay, well, I think it's uh, now seven o'clock, so we'll uh, we'll start this lecture. So welcome to this second um, lecture in the Robots Quiz and Action series. It's featuring um, psychology from creativity and expertise. Uh, with me this evening, I've got Dr. Philip, Philip Fine and Dr. Jill Hill, who will be helping me out on the on the uh, chat uh, part. And I think they're just going to show their faces and then um, disappear in a minute um, while I get going with the talk. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and goodbye for a second. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're talking about uh, tonight is uh, filmmaking through the lens of the mind. I'm going to be exploring some psychological perspectives on creative um, storytelling. So what I'm going to be talking about tonight is um, the, the product, so uh, film as an art form, and in particular film as a creative art form. And then we're going to turn our attention towards the end of the, uh, the, the talk to the person. So in the context of film, creative roles in film and what a, a creative person might look like um, in the film industry. So if we think about filmmaking, there are actually lots of forms of filming output. I mean, the very, very basic, the CCTV outside your house. Um, but we can go through things like documentaries and adverts, newsreel, YouTube vlogging. These are all forms of filming output. But perhaps they don't feel very much like an artistic um, art form. Whereas the ones at the bottom of the list on the left-hand side the, uh, here, the cartoons and anime, Netflix soaps, historical drama and feature films, perhaps they start to feel a little bit more like um, an art form. Um, and um, I'm going to draw your attention to the quote by Alter at the top of the screen. Um, it's actually about literature, but I was always arguing that um, literature is remarkable for its densely layered communication, its capacity to open up multifarious connections and multiple interpretations to the recipient of the communication and for the pleasure it gives us as we experience the nice interplay between the verbal aesthetic form and the complex meanings conveyed. And I think that that's probably what we might feel when we're talking about some of these, these items at the bottom here, these commercial feature films, which predominantly uh, are fictional narratives as portrayed by moving images, but that tell a story, they're complex, they're more aesthetic, they're more like an, an art form. I'm just drawing attention to the name of Shimomura and the book Psychocinematics um, here at the bottom. Um, this book is, is well worth pulling out. If you've got an interest in psychology, and films, it's a really good uh, resource. So right back at the beginning of filmmaking, it might well have been reality. Uh, that was that was happening here. When Muybridge originally took a single shot stationary camera and took lots of pictures of a galloping horse, it's a very rudimentary form of film. Um, and it was recording reality. Um, it, it was it was they wanted to know where, what the what the movement of a horse really really looks like. And many of these other modern day filming uh, sort of uh, forms retain this very naive point and film style. Certainly YouTube vlogging, it's recording daily life. There might be some editing, there might be some close ups, but basically it's one camera, possibly even your phone, um, and then uploaded uh, to, to YouTube. Now, feature films and TV drama production is much more sophisticated than that. So there's widespread agreement that what we've got here is a creative art form. We're not simply recording a reality, but we're transforming it and we're conveying a message and storytelling um, through that medium. And we can look at this through a formalist uh, viewpoint. Is it the way that the film looks, the beauty and the aesthetics that's giving us this feel of art? Or is it a constructionist viewpoint? Is it the meaning and the message as constructed with the cooperation of the, the audience? And we're going to take a look at that over the next few slides. So taking a formalist viewpoint, it, we would be thinking that the way a movie is structured is what makes it art. Uh, and here, cutting and continuity are particularly important sort of illusions. Um, we can use things like tracking and panning, tilting, focus shots, even things like jump cuts where the, the, a person would suddenly spring forward unexpectedly uh, because of cutting. And these are creating uh, creative and emotive effects. They're ramping up the sort of energy of the film, maybe suggesting danger or surprise, or maybe a broad panning of a beautiful landscape. It's, the, it's improving the aesthetics of the film. Um, or maybe we're trying to suck the audience in to, to bring them into immersion into the film. 
So cutting and continuity are really, really important. And through these techniques, we can also alert the audience to certain connections. We can give them privileged information. For example, point of view editing, eye line match, and things, some, some techniques like this. This would be like if the idea of a character on the film is that maybe they're going to try to escape through the door, they might look to the door. Well, with the camera, the camera will actually follow that eye line gaze and will start to zoom in on the handle. Now, without even saying anything, we're now aware of what's going on in the mind of, of, that, of that actor. We can get close-ups of someone's face. We can capture the smallest nuance of, of emotion, a glistening tear. Um, and we can also mimic other real life attentional switches. These are things that we do. We switch our attention to the door handle or to a person's face um, when we are paying attention um, in, in real life. It's mimicking that through the camera. We can also use cross-cutting between simultaneous scenes as well to suggest, um, uh, to build tension and to suggest uh, connections uh, implicitly. For example, if a man's getting ready, cutting to a woman getting ready, back to the man getting ready, and a woman getting ready to go out, the implication is that their paths are going to cross, they're going to meet somehow, either deliberately or otherwise. So juxtaposition and association are really important um, as well. Now, from the 1960s, movies have employed intensified continuity editing. And the films that you're seeing now, modern films, now have a cut every two to three seconds to, to, to uh, put some of these, these techniques to, in, into the film. So these are really sophisticated production techniques. It's an artful sleight of hand. It looks like it's natural, but it's not reality. This is a highly crafted art form. And from a performance point of view, we can also explore the ideas that time and pace can be fluid in a film as well. The camera can go anywhere in space or time. And this again is creating a non bona fide world for us. It's portraying much more information than we should know. So there could be flashbacks um, to you know, the very early life of an actor or even flash forwards, if there is such a term, to the end of their life. And we shouldn't know this. We get this feeling of omnipresence. It's much more information that we should be aware of in real life. And time and place can be telescopes as well. Uh, we're all familiar with the, you know, the action just dissolves or fades out and then reappears again. And the implication is that time has passed, maybe several years, decades um, has passed in the interim. The rhythmic pace is varied as well to create interest. You might have a very long, slow pan uh, panoramic shot uh, that takes its time. And in other, the next scene, it might be very chop, 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 very, very quick to increase the pace and heighten the interest. The mise-en-scene, so the sets as well, are constructing a spatial context uh, for films to, to take part in. It's all very uh, artificial, um, but uh, convincing um, uh, sort of context. Um, so movie sets are comprising a visual illusion. In fact, a lot of them are only viewable from some angles. Behind that, there's carpentry, um, but it looks real. And of course, computer generated imagery takes us now into spaces where you know, we can be anywhere really um, now through the use of CGI. Now, from a formalist viewpoint, um, often people espouse a sort of um, auteur theory of, of filmmaking. Um, the idea is that almost like other art forms, you know, dance or art or music, um, we might be able to say that a film is, uh, belongs to a certain director who's put their, their stamp on it. So just as we could say it's a Monet painting or a Beethoven symphony, we would be able to say it's a Hitchcock film or a Woody Allen or a Quentin Tarantino film. Or we, would, we would know this because there's a certain quality, a certain style, or technique associated with specific filmmakers. Um, and so we're attributing the creative vision of a movie to this, to this single person, this single artist, usually the director. Now we'll come back to that a bit later on. From a constructionist viewpoint, um, we might well observe that uh, film as an art form is actually playing out in the mind of the observer as well. So that it would be argued to be an art form because it is evoking an aesthetic or a hedonic response, um, just like a painting or just like any other art form is getting a reaction from us. 
And certainly a film um, does evoke a reaction from us. You know, we might come out of the film and say, oh, I love that film. And somebody else might say, no, it was rubbish. I hated it. Uh, or we might not even be able to articulate why we, we felt that, or maybe we can pin it down to any aspect of the film, the visuals, the action, how it makes it feel, us feel. Maybe we like the actor, um, you know, or, or the subject matter or, or whatever. We're certainly responding involuntarily to deliberate triggers in the film. Um, movies have this extraordinary power of engaging our emotion and getting that, that, that sort of shock or disgust or fear or distress. Um, we, they, can, they can generate aesthetic chills and frisson as well, goosebumps, for, for example. So that big panorama, maybe uh, seeing the universe spread out in front of us, that would be awe-inspiring. Maybe we get shivers of, of awe at that. Or maybe we feel the creep of horror in a horror film as, as we get a tingle up the back of our spine. And this can be heightened by silence, as a calm of impending terror coming our way. Music's important, congruent or incongruent music, and abrupt sounds like a scream, abrupt notion, suddenly that shock uh, coming and appearing in front of us, um, and laughter, of course. So all the time we've got this real-time activation of the corresponding neuronal areas. We've got our startle reflexes, our, the limbic area, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, all this is being aroused um, all the time as we're watching um, a film. We're very engaged in this medium. But of course, there will be individual differences in this. I mean, theory of mind might affect, for example, our ability to empathize uh, with characters. But in general, film is definitely playing out in the mind of the observer. We're also not naive. There's collusion with the filmmaker. There's a willing suspension of belief. Um, we know that Superman can't really fly. We know we can't go back to the future and we can't shrink the kids. Um, but while we're in that film, you know, we're sort of saying to the filmmaker, oh, go on then, I'll, I'll buy it. Go on, I'll play along with it. Um, just while I'm in the cinema, we'll go along with the fiction. So this is tension between um, being in the art form and looking at the art form. Um, it's, it's rather similar to being in an art gallery or to reading a really good novel. We can get sucked into to, to the, to the storyline. It's called an adhesion to fiction. We actually get sucked right in. Um, it can even lead to total immersion of flow state where time um, that seems to stand still. We're not even noticing it passing. And, you know, our attention is so drawn to what's in front of us that almost the ceiling could fall in and we wouldn't even notice. So there's this deep down awareness that we're not actually in the scene, uh, but yet we're absorbed, we're sucked in, in a very physical way. From a constructionist viewpoint as well, the, the audience isn't naive. They've come primed for this film. Uh, we're, we always bring our own personal and cultural knowledge, our schemas, um, to the experience. So we'll come with certain expectations about a certain film genre or filmmaker or movie title or actor. We might even have seen trailers or reviews in the press. So we've got this sort of knowledge of what's, what's to come. I mean, down here, if you knew that you're going to a film with trailers that looked like this, uh, you would be knowing full well what sort of film you were, you were going to come and see. And the experience will be quite different for those who have never been to a James Bond film or don't, don't, don't have these, these clues. So the audience has also internalised all those filmic codes I was looking, I was talking about earlier. So we built up expertise through repeated exposure to cinematic material. We understand what these momentum shifts are about. We understand the use of continuity and cross-cutting. We get used to flashbacks and telescoping of time. It's not natural. The first time you'd see that, you'd wonder what was going on, but we get used to that um, as, we, as we get exposure. We also come with an expectation of an Aristotelian narrative form, by which I mean that there's going to be a defined beginning, middle, and an end to the film. There'll be various events along the way, maybe a reversal of fortune and a climax and the resolution of misunderstandings. Um, but the plot and the character arcs are the, the, the key backbone of the storyline in film and writing. And they, they've, they're developed from the get-go. This is the key, this is the core of a film, this Aristotelian narrative form. So all in all, top-down processing is a key facet of our film watching enjoyment. 
Uh, we've got the interpretation of the symbolic code of the film. We're blending the current action with our own experiences. Um, and we're going beyond the information given directly by the film um, to interpret it in sometimes a very personal, a very personal way, depending on our own um, experiences. So I hope by now you, you, you feel that, yes, OK, film is an art form, but is it a creative art form? So we have to turn here to um, a, a sort of definition of creativity. One of the most common ones is by Feist in 1998. The creative thought or behavior must be both novel, original and useful, adaptive. So we're going to talk about those in turn. We'll start with utility. We often have a problem with the usefulness of the performing and the aesthetic arts. It's why we have such difficulty getting funding. Um, it's so much easier for the scientists. Um, I mean, what use is a painting? What use is a dance? And certainly in terms of, of the performing arts, the, the arguments that are often brought forward are that, well, first of all, there is social community. So we're exploring aspects of the human condition. There is a shared cultural capital here with um, maybe inspiration or maybe information and role models that we can, that we can pick up on. There's also this immersion and engagement in unexplored territories. We can confront the, that, that shark, that unexperienced uh, danger. And the great thing is, we know we're perfectly safe. We can immerse ourselves safely because it's all a film, but yet we can experience secondhand um, the, uh, the, the risk. And maybe even there might be catharsis um, from experiencing something that's very similar to something um, that may be even traumatic or, or buried in our past. And we could come to a film and maybe um, uh, explore it through our own personal experiences and find resolution. We can allow our imagination to flourish as well through these what if, what if I could shrink the kids? Um, and this is um, called conceptual expansion. It's quite an important sort of theme in the creativity literature. It's going beyond the possible to conceive the impossible and all the ramifications of that. And in the end, it's fun, of course. I mean, there's escapism from the humdrum everyday life, uh, stimulation, feeling alive, and these vicarious highs um, and lows. But what about novelty and originality? Well, the funny thing is that, I mean, in, both in literature and films, um, a lot of people sort of argue that they follow rather a cliched format. Uh, so I've already mentioned this Aristotelian form. Um, and uh, script writers often use these rigorously defined templates that have these certain events placed at certain times. And certainly Booker, who was talking about literature, but the same applies really, um, he, he, he actually suggested that there are only seven basic plots of literature. For example, rag, rags to riches might well be something like Great Expectations. Uh, the Quest, what about Lord of the Rings? Um, and Killing the, the Monster, well, Harry Potter. Um, so that he was certainly suggesting there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, Blake Snyder took a very similar um, uh, viewpoint in his book, um, Save the Cat. Um, he argued that films were very cliched. Um, in the first act, you'd introduce the main character with a heroic act that endeared them to us. Maybe they'd save the cat. Uh, whereas the second act would build tension as the protagonist was facing a series of challenges. And finally, you'd reach the climax, resolve the conflicts, reduce the tension, and we'd all go home happy. So he was suggesting actually that, that well, films aren't actually that novel. And certainly if we look at the really successful box office um, hits that, that coin in a lot of money, um, some of them really aren't creative at all. They seem to run along the lines of you devise an initial concept, so you replay those over prequels and sequels, and there may be variations on a similar theme. There's some development, but the films are belonging to a recognizable family of franchise. I mean, in the end, the concept might eventually peter out when it's run its course or it's out of ideas, the audience is bored and most importantly, the box office takings are down and then it would be abandoned. Now we could consider this through Curtin's adaptation and innovation theory um, from the creativity literature. Curtin suggested that there were innovators and adapters. 
innovators would be uh, wanting to throw away the rule book. They want to reject the existing approaches um, completely. So a completely new direction, new construction, a new starting point, and maybe new combinations. Whereas he argued that in creativity, there was still a place for the adapters who want to build on what we have with incremental development. Maybe there would be a certain amount of replication, but there might be some reinterpretation and we might move one step or even two steps um, forward um, from, from, from where we started. And in fact, that's how science, most of science operates. I mean, very rarely does science uh, innovate and throw away the rule book entirely. Normally, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, as they say. So if we apply his theory to movies, uh, the innovators in movies as well, the truly innovative um, might be some of the films on this far right hand side. Um, the groundbreaking innovations in cinematography or editing or narrative, for example, the first talkie, the first CGI, the first full feature animation, the first of, of, of anything. We might have new combinations. You take classical music, you take animation, and you've got Fantasia. If you took live action and animation, the first one the film that did that was Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Or we might introduce audiences to a new genre, the first serious sci-fi, the first epic scale feature film, the first film that set the standard for horror. So we've got a lot of firsts here, and these, these probably could be described as truly innovative and rule-breaking. We could go a stage further. We could go completely avant-garde. And in fact, there was a wave um, in the 20th century of um, surrealism and experimental uh, filmmaking. Um, for example, uh, looking at these films uh, along the, along the uh, towards the middle here, Un Chien Andalou um, was a film actually by Salvador Dali, the artist, in 1929. And this was surrealist. I mean, it had no coherent structure at all. It was shot after shot that made no sense. Um, so this was apparently celebrating the poetic possibilities of free association. Um, it was also casually horrific if you're thinking of going and watching it. It's, uh, it's, it's not for those with a delicate stomach. Um, the Andy Warhol film in the middle, um, Empire, this was deliberately challenging whether we needed narrative um, and whether film had to be entertainment. So it was an eight hour series of shots of the Empire State Building as the sun went down and the sun came back up again. And that was it. Um, Piero Le Fou, down at the bottom here, um, this challenged whether we really needed continuity um, in films. Uh, the shots were jumbled out of order, so unlike the Aristotelian beginning, middle and end, there, there wasn't any, you, you as the audience saw a jumble of beginnings, middles and ends, and you had to decide which order you needed to take the scenes in. Um, so challenging the need for, for continuity. Now clearly these are innovative, um, so they definitely tick the novelty box, but have we, have we lost a bit of utility um, here? I mean, perhaps not. They, the films were probably not really meant to be watched for enjoyment, but they were intending to challenge our preconceptions about film. But they do need a lot of inside knowledge to appreciate and interpret. They're really only looked at nowadays by, uh, by students of, of, of theatre and, and cinema. And so um, they're not for, every, not for everyone. Turning to the adapters of movie, well, we might be looking here at some of the films over, over, over this side with the aesthetically beautiful. So I picked Sleepy Hollow and Amelie here. These are both uh, renowned for being very stylistically perfect and charming and lovely music and vivid colours. And that was why they won their BAFTAs. Uh, we might also adapt books very, very well. Um, like the Lord of the Rings or some of the Harry Potter um, adaptations. And again, these were why they were nominated or won Oscars. They, they took something from another uh, medium and, um, and turned it into a film very, very well, very aesthetically beautifully. And then, of course, we get the plane to the box office. So we get the franchises like Pirates, Star Wars and Shrek. 
uh, the franchising for profit. Now here we've got problems because there's very limited room for development and, and creativity. Uh, we're very constrained by key features of the original. We've got to retain those if the audience is going to be reassured that they're right, the right, that they're at the right film. If you go to a James Bond film and there's no car chase or clever gadgets or cackling vi vi villain, then you're not going to feel that it's a, a James Bond film. So you've got to keep elements and yet you've got to avoid it feeling stale, the sort of retread of the previous films. And it's a very difficult balance um, to, to strike. So in the end, who's judging this creativity and success? Well, a film's direct success and its director's reputation is the critical reception it's getting, but there's a wide range of people who've all got a viewpoint. I mean, it could be the box office receipts, it could be the review sites or the critics in the newspapers, or you might judge it by how many Oscars or, or, or whatever it's won. Uh, and everybody's going to have a slightly different viewpoint on what makes a good film. For example, Plucker and, and colleagues in 2009, um, they actually looked at um, expert um, critics from the newspapers and film buffs, amateur film buffs, um, who had left comments on RottenTomatoes.com. And they compared their ratings to those of the public. Actually, it was a student sample, but the, the general public as represented by students. And they found that the, um, the film buffs and the newspaper critics um, were very close in their judgment, um, whereas the, the, this, the students were very much at odds with the experts, but also amongst themselves with a very great variety on what they thought actually made a good film. Probably um, for the general public, the sweet spot that will certainly maybe get best box office receipts is between adaptation and innovation. If we're just doing replication, then it's going to lead to boredom. Um, but if we can get a little adaptation, well, you know, there might be some interest. Innovation, you would hope, would lead to some excitement. Um, but if you take it too far and you end up at the avant-garde end, you're going to end up with incomprehension, at least amongst the general public. Now, I mean, at the Cannes Festival, which is really only open to film industry uh, people, there is a section, in certain regard, where uh, films with uh, academic interests, but that are commercially unviable, are, are aired. And, and you can go and watch those, but there's no, um, there's no thought of actually making these available to the, to, to the, to the public. What predicts success in the Oscars? Well, a 30-year retrospective study by Simonton um, looked at um, award-winning films and then uh, looked at what other prizes they'd won for some of the, you know, best actor or director or whatever. Broke it down amongst the sort of dramatic elements, the actors, directors, etc., the visual, the technical and the musical elements. And what he found was that um, it, the dramatic elements were the strongest predictor and of those the director most of all. So essentially, if a film gets an Oscar, almost certainly its director is going to get an Oscar as well. Then it was the screenwriters, then it was the male actors, and then it was an awful lot of other things. And then least important were the female actors, uh, almost down at the bottom. Uh, I think that says quite a lot about the roles that women get to play in films, although that's probably another talk for another, for another time. Switching now to the actual um, person uh, within film, we might have a look at the creativity of the, of, of, of the person, the film person, um, through the lens of the 4C model of creativity uh, by Kaufman and the Ghetto. This has various layers of creativity, mini C, little C, pro C, and, and big C. Um, and it's a sort of developmental model that's, that's looking at an increase of expertise as you go up the layers. Right down at middle, mini C, for example, you might have the person who is for the first time picking up a phone and, and videoing their, their family and friends. So it's very naive, it's very beginner level. It's very new for them, but it's not new for the rest of the world. It's been done before. Um, moving up to little C, this involves perhaps a bit of replication, perhaps a bit of adaptation. There's some everyday creativity going on here. This might be where the amateur of logging on YouTube um, comes in. And you can get some fairly slick results there, but it's going to have been achieved without formal training. It's more still tinkering and self-discovery and, and perhaps not a, a fully professional um, output. Whereas moving up to Proceed, this is where the professionals start to come in. 
This here you might really expect to find adaptation and perhaps even some innovation, a professional contribution involving expertise, formal training and apprenticeship, possibly even a degree. So we're not setting the world on fire, but necessarily, but there's going to be some skillful and reliable execution of um, the art form um, at that at that level. And finally, we might move right up to uh, to Big C, um, the innovation of Big C, um, which, as it suggests, uh, implies a significantly eminent uh, contribution, maybe creativity to change the domain forever. And here's where we get our household names, our Hitchcocks and, and, and so on, our Oscar winners, uh, multiple Oscar winners. So thinking about filmmaking and the creative professional, um, there are a very wide range of roles played in producing a film. I mean, the director is the most obvious one to study because of auteur theory, it sort of rather thrusts it in our, in our face. But we have to remember that there are other roles that are critical too. There's a complex interplay when you're putting a film together. Now, for those who want to study eminence, they're interested in creative eminence, obviously the big C, the director and the Hitchcocks, you know, who wins, why would somebody win an Oscar and somebody else doesn't? That might be the sort of questions that they might ask. Um, but there's quite a lot to be thought about um, in the pro C level as well, which isn't often as, as studied. Little C and big C tend to be studied quite a lot in creativity. Pro C is really quite an interesting area. Um, over on the right hand side of the screen, we've got such a lot of roles, but apart from the producer and director, there's the casting director who has to actually see in their mind or, or choose the right person for the role that they're envisioning. There's the screenwriter who's actually crafting the imagined dialogue, the flow of events. The production designer, they, they, they do the storyboarding. Now, this is really interesting. They take the ideas of the director, the screenwriter, and they, they translate that into a series of literally boards um, with, with uh, sketches to try to translate that vision for the rest of the crew so they understand um, the sort of effects that the people are aiming for. So storyboarding. The art director does the sets. We've got the costume designer, we've got makeup, um, the cinematographer who's going to do all those clever camera angles and panning. Um, and then the editor whose cuts, cutting choices make such a profound effect on the film. Then there's the music, the composer, the actors and so on. There are so many people involved. So when we say it's a Quentin Tarantino film, there's so many people behind the scenes, all at at least a pro C level of, of expertise um, who are creative professionals too. If we look at um, a componential model of creativity, so looking at the kind of thing that might make up a, a creative person, there's a model by Marble here. Um, Typically, when we have a creative person, we've got a sort of merging of um, domain skills of knowledge and technical skills, maybe some specialized talents, together with motivation, so the passion and the curiosity for the field, but also some creative thinking skills, which I'm going to go um, over on the next on the next slide. So things like divergent thinking, tolerance for ambiguity. But one of the things that isn't often mentioned in the list is imagination, and I'm going to come to that um, in the towards the end of the of the talk. So just sticking with the the, the usual creativity re relevant traits. Um, Certainly, um, unconventionality and autonomy is normally thought important for the creative personality. And, and here in film, you know, spurning the commonplace, well, we would like to have it, this new idea, this creative idea for our, for our film. And we might need to take a risk with the film. Uh, we might have to have that self-belief that we are, that a Barbie film really would be a, a jolly good idea. Um, Divergent thinking, um, we would need to keep open-ended possibilities to understand that there's no right answer, to keep turning around the ideas and keeping it open-ended. And set breaking as well, avoiding getting stuck in that rut. So thinking outside the box, um, you know, to avoid getting, getting replaying, uh, retreading um, old films. And tolerance of ambiguity as well. So avoiding black and white thinking. We want a nuanced, we want a complex um, film that's going to bring lots of different angles and lots of different things to different people. And resistance to premature closure as well. We've got to keep things open. We've got to be able to think in 50 shades of grey. 
So thinking about personality, a uh, typical sort of big five personality traits, um, we would definitely need to be high in this openness to experience, to absorb these ideas, to welcome ideas from different cultures, different, different art forms, um, and to also have that aesthetic engagement as well. We might be high in neuroticism. Um, certainly the actors are always um, use examples of a histrionic personality. Um, maybe low in agreeableness because you're not a yes person. Um, and maybe low in conscientiousness because you're not a rule follower either. Um, possibly high in extroversion if you pattern with the actors and the other people in the theatre. Though a lot of creatives actually are quite, um, quite low, quite introverted, including musicians and artists. But what about imagination? Um, Mental imagery um, the, is, is, is one way that we think about imagination, is pictures in the mind. There are individual differences in this, in this facility. Some people have vivid pictures and some people have no images at all. This is called aphantasia. So there's been a lot of debate about whether creativity involves imagination uh, and particularly pictures in the mind in fact whether it's related to the strength of our mental imagery and the funny thing is that although you think imagination to so imagining ideas in your mind and seeing it there the research has been a little bit ambivalent on this point nonetheless there have been many reports of creative moments that have been associated with visual imagery vividness and Hitchcock is one of the names that pops up amongst the artists together with Coleridge and Keats and quite a few others Amongst the scientists, uh, Kekulé, Poincaré and Einstein have all been um, said to have had their big moments associated with a vision, a sort of a picture of exactly how it must be. So we might be looking at what aspects of visual imagery might be important to imagination and creativity and whether this varies from field to field as scientists and artists, for example. What we're really asking then is, with these pictures in our minds, is visual imagery unidimensional? Is it as simple as you've got it or you haven't? Now, one of the interesting things is that for real vision, so when we're using our eyes, real vision, uh, there are two main pathways of vision. There's the where pathway, the dorsal pathway, which processes motion and spatial coordinates and where things are. There's also the what pathway, the ventral pathway, which identifies what something is and processes color and shape and texture. So the great thing is that apparently mental imagery seems to use the same pathways. We appear to generate real vision in our, in our head. It's amazing, but it is weaker. Uh, so the idea is that mental imagery in the where pathway um, would be associated with being able to rotate things in our head or manipulate uh, parts of components of things. So associated with strengths in maybe scientific creativity like maths and design engineering and invention. Whereas the ventral pathway, which is associated with this processing of color and shape and texture and being able to see bright colors and, uh, and, and, and imagine textures, perhaps velvet or whatever, this is associated with artistic creativity and with aesthetic appreciation. And this is all based on the research by Bezhenkova and Kozhevnikov. But there's another wrinkle because Mayer and, um, and, and colleagues also distinguish between proximal imagery, sort of the here and now, the boring mundane details of, well, can you imagine how to make a cup of coffee in your head or what your next door neighbor looks like? Um, and distal imagery, which goes back to that conceptual expansion I was talking about earlier, what it might be like to live in the next century or at the bottom of the ocean or to shrink the kids. So we've got this proximal and distal sort of dimension um, as well. So in a recent paper that I put together, I, I proposed a model of mental imagery that fused these two um, dimensions. I'm not going to go through all of it right now. We haven't got time. Um, but I just want to look at these, these four pop outs um, here. Um, on the kind of everyday imagery, the sort of remembering of things that really, really exist, um, we might look at this little box here in terms of, of filmmaking. Um, this is where we have a high aesthetic imagination of colors and shapes of real, you see a piece of material, um, maybe that piece of velvet I was referring to. And, and here we might look perhaps to the skills of people like the costume designers or the makeup artists. We're recalling something that we want to imitate and we've got the textures and the colors in our mind. 
Over here on the scientific pathway, um, we've got novel and combinatorial inventive ideas. So this might actually in film speak to new production techniques, maybe cinematography and cutting and of being able to imagine, well, perhaps if we raise the camera or we put it at this angle or that, how would that affect the way that the film is going to look? and the the the, uh, the speed of the action the pace or the or the danger that we're communicating if we turn to this artistic area here uh, of scene development and storyboarding in the mind um, this is being able to visualize very clearly what a scene might look like what the characters might look like as they interact what they might say to each other what their expressions might be how they might be dressed and what they what setting they're in and this is certainly something that's very relevant to playwrights and novelists, but also perhaps to the casting director, the director himself and the production designer. And down here we have, again on the artistic area, the conceptual expansion, the sort of generative counterfactual imagination of imagining the impossible. So these storylines and plots that have never been dreamt of before. And I think the film Everything Everywhere All at Once had such an impact because it was ticking such a lot of these boxes. There were some very new production techniques. It was an amazing storyline um, and they were imagining the impossible uh, with, some, with some quite unique characters um, being, being brought in. So we could ask the question of how will filmmakers pattern according to that model of mental imagery? Is their imagination more artistic? Is it to do with imagining scenes and people and colours and stories that are being played out and elaborated? Or is it these wildly inventive scenarios and settings? Or is it more to do with the angles and the shots and the technical innovations? Is it more scientific? More likely it's role specific. So you might say, well, the cinematographer is going to look a lot more like a scientist than perhaps the screenwriter, director and casting director who might look more artistic. Certainly actors are thought to use vivid imagination extensively. If they're following method acting, then they need to live their part, their part truthfully. So they need emotional and empathetic congruency with their part. That means visualizing their characters' motivations, emotions, expressions, physical movements, environmental environments, even their backstory, sort of what happened in their childhood, inventing it yourself putting yourself into that position, how might they have got to this position and inventing it in your mind? One question might well be, well, for those who have really achieved eminence, those big C, uh, would you need both? It's they're conventionally thought of as either or, but maybe the big C directors or the, the people who achieve greatness, maybe they break that mold, maybe they've got both, um, and perhaps that's what makes them uh, unique. We don't know though, because the research has never uh, been done. It's something that we very much uh, like to look into. So I've actually come to the end of my talk. It's a bit of a quick whirlwind through through uh, film. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you want to think, well, what, what next? Well, do check out our blog to read more about our research, not necessarily on films, but there's a, a blog there with a QR code. And if you do have a moment, we'd love you to take part in the survey, again, not on films, but that we're running with one of our PhD students, Lucy, um, at the moment. And there's another QR code at the bottom. Um, and now I'm very, very happy to take um, questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Catherine, for a very interesting talk. Uh, I should have said at the beginning, uh, there is a Q&A box. So um, although uh, those of you watching can't come on screen or on microphone, please do put your questions into the Q&A box if you haven't already done so. Um, I think Catherine, you'd be happy to take some questions. Um, so let's let's have a little look at uh, some that have been suggested. Um, let's see. You were talking about um, imagery and imagination. You mentioned a fantasia about people mm. who don't have such uh, levels of, uh, of imagination. Oh. Do you think that someone with a fantasia could work in the film industry, or, or would they find it too? limiting i suppose yeah and that's tricky isn't it i mean i think it would depend on the role and i think it would depend on the t determination of the individual and there's no such thing as you know, impossible um 
I think it might be very difficult to be a top class actor without having the ability to put yourself right into that 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 path and to, to, to put yourself in the shoes of the other character. So thinking it cognitively possibly isn't the same as being able to actually um, inhabit the, the the role. And I think that that possibly implies a certain amount of, of, of living for real in the mind. All the same, I mean, many many of the Hollywood actors have actually taken method acting to, to extremes and they've externalised it. I mean, there was, um, I think, Jared Leto, he, he sent uh, his suicide squad to the sort of cast members. He was sending them animal carcasses, you know, and he was playing the Joker. And, and, and so he was actually externalised this. And I think Daniel Day-Lewis, he actually famously, he learned to actually uh, paint and type with his feet, just like Christy Brown. So that, that when, when he was doing uh, my, my left foot. So that wasn't happening in the mind. They were actually transferring that into real life and living the part, if you see what the distinction I'm trying to, to make here. But I mean, that goes well beyond what would normally be expected from uh, method acting, which is, which is more a mental, a mental process. I mean, there is, there, interesting that there is um, Glenn, um, Glenn Keane, who's the artist who drew Disney's Little Mermaid, um, now he actually does have aphantasia, and which is it is quite incredible. He should be able to um, to draw this cartoon uh, character, a very successful one, entirely by reference to the external image. He has no mental image of what he wanted to draw um, before he he started to do. It. Um, his technique is just to put a lot of squiggles on the page and then to rub out lines until it mm. looks like. I don't know judging it what yardstick but it looks like what he feels he wants to achieve um but it must that must be very difficult and time consuming it but as I say there's no such thing as impossible but it might just make the process a bit more bit more bit more difficult yes yes thank you very much uh Jill yeah I've got another question here so you had the slide with the Simonton study Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I was very struck by, you know, female best actors were not at all protective of yeah. overall Oscars in a film. Um, so these kind of this idea of, I guess, relegating women to secondary yeah. roles. And I'm wondering how, I mean, you'd mentioned Barbie, which immediately struck me there. And, yeah. and do we think that this has changed since that study? Because I think it was a 2000 and early 2000s study. So, so to what extent do you think it has changed? Um, yeah, well, there have been a couple of interesting films. There's the Barbie film, and of course there is the um, Everything Everywhere All at Once as well, mm. which is it's, it's very unusual. It's actually cast a kind of, well, a non-white, over 50-year-old female in the leading role that really matters. And that's really very, very rare um, in indeed. Um, I'd like to say I think it's changed. Um, you can always pick out these really, um, you know, the, these these headline films, but um, I don't know that actually, you know, in the everyday films that it's changed that that much. Um, certainly in the states, they they've been doing they do keep tabs on this. There's something called the Card Report. That's um, don't know whether it's an annual report, but the last certainly the one in 2017, they were still reporting a two to one gender ratio in favour of the spoken lines given to males in films. And of course, it's not just the, the, the quantity of the lines, it's actually the quality of the lines as, as well. I mean, whether, whether females are actually taking on a part that's, that's meaningful um, within, within the, the plot or whether they're, they're really there as um, eye candy. Um, and certainly in the past and probably still today, um, you, you know, having the looks, having the beauty is is very important to casting. Um, it's very rough on, on older women in particular. Who they, women have a much shorter shelf life than, than, than men um, in, in the film industry. Um, and um, certainly some of the roles um, given to over 50 year old women are not, not key roles. In fact, they, I think there was a report called something like Frail, Frumpy and Forgotten, um, which, was, which was produced uh, by the Gina Davis Institute. Um, and they were just looking at the roles given to, 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 to 50 year old plus um, women. And it, they were, they were, they were grumpy ages and they were, they were normally, you know, housebound or, or, or whatever. And they weren't playing a role that made a difference yeah and the older so, women who do have these roles 
uh, like Judy Dench and Maggie Smith are very much in the minority. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I think it goes beyond, um, you know, the casting and the, you know, the, 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 the actual actors as, as, as well. I mean, it goes right through the film industry. There are a lot of, I mean, if you look at diversity within the film industry itself, there are a lot of women in things like makeup and uh, costume design, um, but hardly any in things like cinematography and even in directing. I mean, you know, with a few notable ex exceptions, uh, directing is still largely a male um a male uh, role thank you yes um another question um here well, when we think about training for movies mm. or stage work but especially movies we tend to think about the actors at stage school where did the actors train but you've explained this all these other roles mm. and i just wonder whether you thought it benefits all those other roles to have had their own experience of acting. Is it useful to have acted to be a director or a cinematographer or a casting director? I would have said from a directing point of view, it, it probably probably would be. Um, in terms of the cinematography, the camera, the, these tend to be quite technical um, skills that are actually often but taught by MSc um, in, or, or, or a BSc um, in, at the university. So you're actually picking up a, a qualific trained qualification. I, I tell about cinematography. That's a lot to do with the camera angles and quite quite technical. Same with the sound recording and a lot of the sort of uh, techie techie roles. But I would have thought that with directing, um, it would certainly benefit. I would have said, but I don't know to to have actually been standing in the shoes of of an actor and to have experienced both sides both sides of the, of, the, of, the, of the coin. It's an interesting question. I should think there probably would be a, quite a divide um, between the more technical, I mean, things like uh, lighting and the costume design, uh, makeup, uh, uh, the, 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 the cutting possibly, um, directing might, might well benefit, yeah. Thank you. Um, there's one so other question oh. that's coming. Uh, Jill, I think this is very much up your street actually. I was, well, I was going to say, that, oddly, my attention was drawn to this one as well, given the concept of my talk a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah, what effect will AI have on the filmmaking process? So which roles do you think, for example, are most at risk? Oh, yeah, that's a sort of like um, flavour of the month, isn't it, with the actors' strike at the at the moment. And you can see that why they're worried. Uh, I mean, uh, the idea that their image might be taken just at one day of you know performing in front of the camera and then deep fakes forever after um it's a it's a, it's a tricky moment and i think we're at a, a quite a a critical uh, moment in deciding what we want from films um certainly i think the the actors are quite concerned i think for the extras at the moment um and those roles i think are really quite vulnerable because um you know, it must cost a lot of money, um, frankly, to get maybe 150, um, you know, extras onto the set at the right time, wearing the right costumes and things. And if you could say to AI, OK, so look, I want, um, you know, a, 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 a an audience of 25 to 50 year old. They have to be Chinese. They have to be this. They have to be that. And just just fake it for me. Um, and that this could be done convincingly enough because it's extras um, through AI. I think that's a, that's a genuine risk, to be honest. Um, I think also perhaps things like uh, stunt, um, stunt performers as well, stunt men, stunt women, um, that could be at risk because it, the, the, even even however much they, they want to take a risk, there is a limit to what the human body can take. Um, but if you get deep fake um, to, to to do this, you can make the stunts ever more um, ever, ever more um, uh, radical, uh, ever ever more um, sort of adventurous, if you like, without the risk that you're actually going to going to kill somebody. You can just all be faked. Um, the insurance costs of your film will probably go down substantially as well if you're not taking the risk. So I, I don't know. And the actual lead actors themselves, I, I like to feel, but I don't know whether I'm right, um, that 
close up and actually, you know, close up and, and dirty with, with, with the actor, you really actually have to have a human doing it at the moment. I don't think AI is there. Um, and I say that because AI at the moment anyway, does not actually have emotion or empathy or any of those human characteristics. Now, I mean, you can have bad actors um, who don't really get into the part, who don't really empathize and don't really um, live the part truthfully. Um, sure, you can get that, but, but the really good actors um, do bring something that extra quality to the to the to the part and whether ai can really fake that or whether it would still look like an uncanny valley where we're kind of spooked by it um and it's not quite real it's not quite there um i i i don't i don't know um so i think you know it, it depends a lot on what the audience um, does as well. I, I mean, computer-generated imagery has been used a, a huge amount for the backdrops and, and things. Um, I think the extras, but whether we would really be happy not to have real actors on our films, I don't, I don't know. And I think yeah. a lot would actually depend on the audience reaction as well. Would we really show up for a film that was completely computer-generated that purported to be human? Yeah. I mean, we've seen that. I, I'm certainly in some, not in film, but in other kind of mediums where there's that aesthetic quality or that appreciation mm. and people seem to rate i think ai produced much lower than human produced even mm. though they're of equal quality um mm. so there's been some interesting work there so again i wonder if a similar thing as you say with the audience would play out here that we're just not it's just not gonna it's um, just not gonna, fly. gonna buy it yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but I mean, it's difficult to know where this might go. I mean, the budgets for the films, you can see it's an yeah. enormous temptation. I know that D Disney's been working on deep fake for, for many, many years, um, mm. trying to see what the possibilities are. Mm. Yeah. And of, and of course, when, when an actor dies, so I think we saw that with Star Wars, um, <laughs> um, that when someone dies and they actually want to continue the story, yeah. that, you know, that there have been these instances where, well, mm. we, could, we can do it this way and, and use AI to help with that. So, yeah, mm. very, very interesting. Kind of it's an interesting area and it's sort of watch mm. the space really um, yeah 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 well thank you very much um and thank you very much to catherine for an extremely interesting conversation about or, or, or uh, lecture about creativity in the film industry um and the third um the third uh, lecture in this series will be in two weeks time two weeks today uh, and it'll be from me, and it's, rather than looking at creativity, we'll be looking more at expertise, particularly expertise of quizzes. So if you like quizzes, you may want to brush up before that. Um, and we're interested in how is it that expert quizzes know so much? But for this evening, thank you very much, Catherine. And uh, we hope to see the rest of you again in a couple of weeks' time.